Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for the July iteration of the monthly seminar in physical genomics. My name is Benjamin Keene here at CPGE at Northwestern University. Um, we're very excited to welcome our speaker today, Dr. John Sidibe. He is Professor of Biology and Medical Science and Director of the Center on the Biology of Aging at Brown University. Um, he's had a longstanding interest in mammalian genetics, signaling, and cell cycle control. Among many highlights, he wrote the first book on gene targeting and published the first comprehensive in vivo quantification of cellular senescence in aging primates. His current studies focus on genome-wide chromatin changes in cellular senescence and organis organismal aging. Um, Dr. Sidibe, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. For our audience today, um, there's time for questions at the end of the talk. So as you think of them, you can just type them into the Zoom chat, uh, or you can wait till the end, and we'll have time for you to either turn on your mic or type the question in chat at the end. So either way you want to do it. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the research and training programs here at CPGE, please visit us at physicalgenomics.northwestern.edu or follow us on our YouTube, Twitter X, or Instagram uh, accounts. Um, but for now, Dr. Sidibe, if you want to get start with your presentation, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is my sound good? Okay. All right. Terrific. So I'm going to talk to you today uh, about cellular senescence and retrotransposable elements. So let me start right into the um, introduction and ce cellular senescence. So you might not be familiar with this um, phenomenon. I'll just uh, quickly uh, go through it. I like the slide. Uh, these are uh, zombie cells that build up in your body, and uh, they're they're not good. That's really the bottom line. And this whole phenomenon was discovered in the early '60s uh, by uh, Leonard Hayflick, and this is essentially the experiment. You passage cells in cell culture, and then at one point they stop dividing, and they never grow again. And so you might think this is uh, kind of boring, and so did many people at the time. But the one interesting fact is that they don't die. They, they just hang around for, for very, very long periods of time. And uh, so, you know, people started investigating this, and the history of the field went through several phases, and I actually uh, witnessed all of them. Um, Initially, most people felt it was a cell culture artifact. Then it uh, started uh, becoming apparent, data started accumulating, that cellular senescence probably does exist and probably exists in vivo, but it's probably rare and irrelevant. And um, then a little bit of a buildup, it seemed to now become an important hallmark of aging, at least in terms of correlations. And of course, uh, most recently, mostly due to uh, <clears throat> mouse studies, it became quite clear that it actually functionally contributes to many uh, age-related uh, age diseases. So very, very quickly, uh, what are the main features? As I already said, it's an irreversible cell cycle arrest, but not cell death. The major models in cell culture are replicative senescence, so the cells just run out of telomeres, and that's the trigger. And this is, in fact, what Leonard Hayflick uh, discovered, and that's the model that we are using. So I'll talk a lot more about that. If you express an activated oncogene like RAS, you can drive cells into senescence, and you can induce senescence by many stresses, in particular, uh, DNA damage. And so it is believed that a common trigger is irreparable DNA damage. Now, of course, there are beneficial functions of senescence, or otherwise it wouldn't exist in evolution, and several have now uh, are now understood. Its role in aging is uh, believed to be deleterious and, and unintended, kind of living in the 
shadow of senescence, if you in the shadow of evolution, if you want to think about it that that way. And uh, it is now uh, very clear that senescent cells accumulate essentially in all tissues, but to very small numbers. And and this kind of threw us off for quite a while because how could so few cells uh, be be harmful? And then, of course, uh, Judith Campisi discovered the so-called senescence-associated secretory phenotype, and uh, it became very clear that senescent cells secrete many bioactive molecules, in particular pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, matrix remodeling, enzymes, et cetera, et cetera. So you can now begin to understand that senescence is really a gain of function phenotype at the organismal level. And it is really through the SASP that believe that the deleterious effects are manifested on the tissue as a whole. Now, of course, uh, several experiments have now shown that clearance of senescent cells extends lifespan and that senolytic drugs alleviate age-associated pathologies. This in 2020 led to the SENNET Consortium, which is a NIH uh, program uh, run out of the office of the director, funded through the Common Fund, so equivalent to other uh, programs you might know, such as ENCODE or GTEx. And the objective is to essentially make an atlas of senescent cells throughout the human body during normal aging, as well as in disease states. So uh, these two papers, uh, just um, as a quick reference, the left one is the position paper that was written by NIH staff in 2020 that launched uh, the Senate. And on the right is an example of uh, now many papers and reviews and it's you know white papers, et cetera, that have appeared on the subject. And uh, this one actually is in press right now. And uh, it is meant to provide uh, kind of guidelines for identifying senescent cells in tissues. And this has become increasingly complicated because of the many different phenotypes that uh, senescent cells can adopt in different tissues. Uh, you know, we could spend hours talking about this. Uh, suffice it to say that the Senate uh, Consortium, the, the whole endeavor right now is uh, desperately trying to consolidate what we know and, and move forward. So I, I apologize for the confusion. If you start reading this literature, hopefully in the near future, you know, we'll be able to make a little bit more sense out of it. So now uh, switching very quickly to uh, retrotransposable elements. So as you know, uh, about half of the human genome is uh, uh, repetitive sequences and about 40% uh, of the human genome actually comes from transposable elements of, of different varieties. Uh, in the human genome, uh, retrotransposons are uh, quite abundant. And I'm going to talk to you today mostly about the line one retrotransposon, which currently is the only uh, live retrotransposon in, in humans. And it's uh, very ancient. It's not an endogenous retrovirus, as you will see by the structure. It uh, has a very compact genome with only two proteins that are encoded. Of course, one of them is the reverse transcriptase. And it has an internal promoter in the five prime UTR that uh, obviously it has to be a, an internal promoter because it takes the promoter with it as it travels throughout, throughout the genome. And uh, just to underscore the ancient nature of line one, uh, it is represented in all kingdoms of life, including uh, higher plants and bacteria. And in fact, the closest relative to the human line one reverse transcriptase is the reverse transcriptases of group two introns in archaebacteria. So it's 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 been around. There's about four hundred to five hundred thousand copies of it in the human genome. So it's been 
very successful in that in that context. However, it's uh, it's 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 really an amazing um, you know fact that the vast majority of these of these sequences are ancient and mutated and rearranged, and only about two thousand are in fact full length, so contain the uh, internal promoter. And of those, only about 150 are intact, meaning that they don't have any point mutations in the proteins that they encode. And the reason for this is uh, the highly adversarial relationship between uh, retrotransposons, transposons in general, and their hosts. And, uh, you know, this is a classic uh, host parasite relationship, like. HIV or COVID, it just happens that these elements um, it live within your genome. So the conflict is entirely internal. And uh, we have many, many defense mechanisms, uh, maybe foremost heterochromatin silencing, which we will talk a fair bit about, but also other pathways such as uh, small RNA pathways, pi RNAs, and a variety of um, uh, other antiviral mechanisms. And just to underscore the very rapid evolution of line one elements, um, this is the very tip of the tree. Uh, L1HS means a human specific L1. And in fact, uh, it's a distinct subfamily from L1 that exists in chimpanzees. Uh, in evolutionary time, you know, three million, two million years is nothing. And <clears throat> the great majority of the elements that are active in our genome belong to this TA1 group. Uh, the, the older ones having mostly now accumulated point mutations by the fact that they've been successfully silenced by our genomes and they have just been drifting uh, and, and accumulating changes. So very, very interesting picture from the evolutionary point of view. And uh, now you might ask yourself, are uh, retrotransposons in line ones in particular ever expressed? And in fact, they are. And uh, we've known about the expression of line ones during germ cell development and then at another stage during early embryogenesis, the early blastocyst stage. And these are two windows in development where line one is normally allowed to be transcriptionally activated. And this is, uh, you know, imposed on us by the need to epigenetically remodel our genomes uh, during development. So it is during these periods in development that our genomes become essentially completely demethylated so the methylation clock is reset. This allows the elements to be expressed. However, other pathways uh, pick up the slack, and it is during these times that the pi RNA pathway is particularly re required. So in fact, uh, in spite of the expression, at the RNA level, there's minimal transposition at these times. However, this is the only window uh, this is the only opportunity that the elements have to move from one place to an, another. And, you know, this has been understood for quite a while. More recently, it became clear that, in fact, um, line one and in, in other species like mice or flies, endogenous retroviruses are active and they follow the same, same rules. So I, I'm talking about line one predominantly because we're really focused on 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 the human situation right right now. So during these uh, various windows, uh, first uh, was discovered cancer, uh, then senescent cells, uh, later central nervous system, and now most recently uh, organismal aging in general. Uh, these elements can become transcriptionally derepressed. And from the point of view of the element, this is a complete dead end because, you know, in at this point, it can do anything it wants. It's going to die when you die, <laughs> okay? It, it's missed its chance <laughs> to, to, you know, contribute to the next generation. 
However, as is becoming uh, clear, uh, it can, uh, you know, play mischief in our in our bodies, and uh, that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit more. So this is the first paper in 2012 uh, that uh, demonstrated retrotransmission in human cancers. This is a paper from our lab uh, shortly thereafter, uh, where we reported uh, derepression in cellular senescence. Now, since that time, it there's a lot of work and many studies. I just pulled up this one paper, and really, in in summary, it is now well documented that constitutive heterochromatin becomes more age, more open during cellular senescence and also aging, and the overall repeatome becomes transcriptionally upregulated. And this is not limited just to retrotransposons. For example, satellite sequences uh, at centromeres also become transcriptionally active. However, retrotransposons ride this uh, epigenetic wave of relaxation. And so um, it is now uh, well accepted that retrotransposons are activated under certain circumstances in somatic cells. So then we can ask, um, well, you know, what are the upstream events? Uh, I already alluded to, to some of them. In fact, the regulation of uh, line elements is quite complex. There are several pathways that are involved in that. Uh, it's not simply just, you know, opening of the chromatin. But uh, I'm not going to uh, spend more time on that. We've been very interested in the downstream consequences. And that is that, okay, fine, so what? And you can think that there are plenty of opportunities for these elements to, to be mischievous. They have promoters. They can change patterns of gene expression. Uh, they exert epigenetic changes. Of course, they can transpose all over the place, uh, make mutations. Uh, it's known that they destabilize the genome and cause DNA damage. And this is believed to be uh, probably the primary mechanism that is involved in, in cancer. Now, uh, it became clear later, and, and we, we contributed to that work, that these elements can also trigger the interferon system. And by the interferon system, I mean the antiviral and antimicrobial defenses that we have to monitor um, extrinsic in infections, like, you know, infection with viruses or protozoans, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to now uh, talk a little bit about the the pathways that line one element uses to essentially trigger what is the pattern recognition uh, receptor that line one triggers and we believe it's the CGAS sting pathway that senses the uh, line one cDNA and uh, let me just go through this uh, kind of quickly so you know as I mentioned before we were kind of working in this overall paradigm of senescence, uh, driving then aging through uh, chronic tissue inflammation and age-associated diseases. And really the question was, you know, can we blow up this middle? Can we look really a little bit more at the causality of the SASP? What triggers it? How does it evolve? Et cetera, et cetera. And so what we found is that um, a, a, as a consequence of what we believe is, uh, you know, heterochromatin loss, line one elements are transcriptionally expressed and they synthesize cDNA. And then the cDNA triggers the um, DNA sensors, the cytoplasmic DNA sensors. And then this interferon response reinforces the pro-inflammatory phenotype that is mostly driven through the NF-kappa-B pathway. So it's really kind of a collaboration 
between NF kappa B regulated and IRM uh, interferon uh, transcription factor uh, stimulated gene expression. So the evidence, very briefly, is uh, so now we're looking we're we're back with Hayflick and we're looking at the very tip of uh, you know his the Hayflick curve. So the cells are being passaged. Here are they becoming senescent. Now we're looking at expression of line one mRNA, and you can see that it becomes upregulated. Uh, this is simply RT-PCR. Uh, but it happens kind of late. It, it doesn't happen right away. And this is uh, very clearly shown here, where we now believe that um, the activation of uh, upregulation of line one and the interferon uh, stimulation is really the third phase of senescence. So again, this is a timeline. This is the DNA damage response here. So P P20 is the CDK inhibitor. P21 is a is a marker of telomere dysfunction because the cell recognizes critically short telomeres as double strand breaks, and so this this creates, in fact, the cell cycle arrest that you know, has now been well known for a long, long time. This is the SASP, and so that comes up a little bit later. And, uh, you know, here you've got your uh, cytokines, uh, IL-6, uh, uh, matrix remodeling proteins. Uh, there's a whole slew of them. This is just a very small example. And then this is the interferon response. You have, you know, line one. And then you have the interferons, alpha and beta. This is an interferon-stimulated gene. Now, uh, many elements throughout the genome become uh, transcriptionally upregulated. And in fact, uh, most of the, I mean, the canonical type 1 interferon pathway, this is a um, PCR array that, you know, you can purchase from Kygen, and you can see that in senescent cells compared to control proliferating cells, you, you really have essentially all of the components of the pathway, you know, from the interferons to the downstream stimulated genes uh, upregulated. That's also um, shown here. Most of the genes are uh, above the line here. I'm not going to talk about the, the 3X. This is a... Um, I mean, it's kind of a cute story, but it's a little long. We found a way to artificially upregulate endogenous line one elements by, you know, playing with, you know, things like retinoblastoma expression, et cetera. And, and it, uh, to a certain extent, recapitulates what happens in senescence, but that's not really material here. Um, so here's the cDNA. Um, these are senescent cells, and we're staining them with ORF1. So this is the first protein that line one makes, and it's an RNA chaperone, and it's a really nice marker. There are good antibodies. You can see senescent cells express it. Uh, early proliferating cells don't. And you can uh, find, so this is an antibody to RNA-DNA hy hybrids. It's, it's, it's widely used. It's not, it's not perfect. Um, but you can see that uh, uh, hybrids uh, accumulate in the cytoplasm. You can uh, destroy that signal with RNAs. Uh, that, that makes sense. And that treatment with RNAs at the same time um, reveals a signal that can be now detected by an antibody to single-stranded DNA. So, you know, this is not very quantitative. It's, it, it's kind of visual. And, you know, since that time, there's been a lot of work substantiating uh, the ability of line one to become apparently uh, reverse transcribed in the cytoplasm. So during its normal life cycle, the reverse transcription happens in the nucleus as part of the retrotransposition process back into the genome. Now, what we think is happening in senescent cells, remember, senescent cells are not proliferating. And uh, we believe that line one gets stuck in the cytoplasm. It, it, it cannot get into the nucleus in non-dividing cells. And uh, actually, these, these puncta are uh, mostly known now as stress granules. 
So it accumulates in the cytoplasm. It becomes partitioned into stress granules. And then somehow, we don't understand how, the, the cDNA is synthesized and then revealed to, to the CGAS thing sensing pathway. So line ones are also upregulated in mouse tissues. And this, this just shows uh, you know, males, females, different tissues with with age. I mean, very late ages. So, you know, 26 to 29 months old. These are pretty old animals. And um, so this is where the fun begins uh, because you remember I mentioned the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So line one RT is an RT <laughs> after all. And uh, so is HIV RT. Now, uh, Lion one RT is uh, very distantly related to HIV RT. It's related to archaebacterial RTs, but some uh, drugs uh, actually used in the clinic, and the drug that we're using here is called 3TC. Uh, it's still used in the clinic for HIV. Does inhibit to a certain extent, not, not that well, but it does. Um, the line one RT. And so we can treat animals with 3TC and we can see that a variety of these markers. So, you know, essentially what we're doing is we're taking 26 month old animals and we're feeding them 3TC for two weeks. And, you know, we're, you know, assessing uh, using RT PCR the expression of SASP and interferon stimulated genes in a variety of tissues. And so really the bottom line is that, you know, in a general sense, uh, it does seem to reduce the interferon response as well as uh, the SASP response. And this is uh, the last of these slides I'm going to show you. This is just, again, kind of a nice visual picture of this. So we're looking at adipose tissue and the, the red blobs here are macrophages. And so macrophages, uh, these are tissue resident macrophages, and they become much more abundant uh, with aging. This is, you know, one of the well-known um, hallmarks of inflammaging. And uh, adipose, white adipose tissue is particularly uh, susceptible to this. And so basically they just, you know, hang out in, in those tissues and, and presumably contribute to the pro-inflammatory state. But if you treat the animals with 3TC, uh, their numbers are reduced. And that's quantified here. And it's also, you know, we could also see it in different tissues. So for example, this is kidney, and you know, these animals were treated for six months at, at, with, uh, with 3TC. So that's all very interesting, and that's, at least I think it's interesting. And uh, the this is the end of, uh, not the end of my talk, but the end of the published data, because now I'd like to take a deep dive on active line ones in the human genome, just to show you, you know, exactly, you know, what is really happening. And, and remember that this work is, very limited by the highly repetitive nature of these sequences. You know, in particularly the evolutionary young elements are so similar that for most short reads, if you're using Illumina sequencing, uh, for most short reads, they're completely identical. You know, you're, you are really... Um, scratching around for a polymorphism that will allow you to, you know, differentiate one element from another. Now, of course, this has completely changed with long-range nanopore sequencing, and I will show you some of some of that data as, as well. So, you know, now let's get some nomenclature down here. Uh, I'm going to now call L1HS young, and I'm going to call everything else old. And so the convention is PA is primate subfamilies. And one is the evolutionary most recent one. And it goes PA one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 16. Okay. And L, uh, PA one has been renamed HS. So PA one doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's HS. Now, 
if we look at uh, all of HS, so that's these characters here, uh, they are the sum of full length elements, right? Full length 6KB with the U UTR and truncated elements. And the reason why you get truncated elements is because during retrotransposition, many of the new insertions are five prime truncated. And the reason is that the reverse transcriptase starts at the three prime end. And quite a few times it doesn't make it all the way to the five prime end. You know, it's six KBs. So it doesn't make it, but the element is inserted into the genome anyway. So, so this is now true junk because, you know, it's a fragment. It has lost the promoter. It can never be expressed again. Um, so that's just the, you know, fact of life that uh, many uh, new insertions are five prime truncated, just, just as a function of the normal life cycle. Now, of course, we are interested in uh, the full length because we're interested in uh, elements that are expressed from their own promoters. And then those can be subdivided into two categories, intact, which means everything is just peachy. You know, your full length, you don't have any point mutations. If you clone an element like this from the genome, you express it in HeLa cells, it's going to retrotranspose. And then you have a subset that are full length, but have already accumulated a point mutation. So for example, they can no longer express uh, functional reverse transcriptase. There's quite a few of those. Um, so this is where nanopore DNA sequencing comes in because for the first time we can now identify all the non-reference elements. So our genomes are highly polymorphic because there's uh, it's been estimated that there are approximately uh, one new line one insertion for every 120 live births. So uh, out of the 150, elements that you know give or take a few that every human genome contains about a third are polymorphic so they're private to your genome and that's shown here uh, so you know with nanopore dna sequencing long read reads we get 30-fold coverage we can map every element in every genome and this happens to be the fibroblast cell line that we are working with and you can see that it has about 100 line ones. And of those, uh, these purple ones are the ones that are still intact. ALU is much worse because, of course, ALU is tiny and it uses the RT from line one. And so you can see that this, uh, this genome has 800 polymorphic ALU, ALU elements. Um, so it's very important to know this because otherwise, you know, prior to being able to do this, uh, you know, you have RNA-seq data, but <laughs> you don't know where it's coming from because you don't know many of the, of the source elements, right? And so this is the phylogeny of uh, 147 intact elements in this particular genome. And you can see the oldest ones are mostly reference. And then as you get younger and younger, these are all the red ones are the polymorphic in that genome. And here's a sum uh, for this genome, just so you get an idea. There's 150, uh, sorry, 1500 uh, L1HS. As I said, the most of them are truncated. There are some full length. This is the 147 that are active. Now, if you look at the polymorphic elements, the, that does I mean the non-reference elements, a third of the active elements are uh, polymorphic in that, in that genome. So now switching quickly to short read RNA-seq, uh, you can see, let, let's just see what this upregulation looks like. So here we're looking at all the PA elements. Um, some normalized counts, plenty of counts. You can see um, the very nice upregulation late senescence. So proliferating early senescence and boom, late senescence. However, these are all truncated, uh, old full length, L1 inches truncated. You don't even see the intact ones down here, okay? 
So this is that huge wave of, uh, you know, heterochromatin relaxation that will give you, and, you know, if we looked at ancient elements that are conserved all the way down to mouse, those are upregulated as well. However, um, L1HS also, uh, fortunately, rides this wave. You can see now that the counts are getting fewer and fewer. This is one particular data set. And so you can see, you know, you've got the full length and you've got the intact ones that are upregulated here. This is a completely different data set. And, you know, once again, we're looking at proliferating and late senescence. And you can see that. So genic means these are mostly in introns. Non-genic means that the insertion is somewhere else, you know, between genes. You can drive this down to the level of individual elements. So this is now, you, they're numbered by their chromosomal position. And this is intact. We got interested in this one. Is chromosome 14 is highly upregulated. And, oops, sorry. And uh, this is some data from my colleague, Nicola Noretti. Uh, so let's look with, um, you know, high resolution, high C, what happens at this locus. This is, again, separate data set. L1HS is upregulated, that data set. So you can see that the, the line one is right here, okay? It's intergenic. It's between genes, but it's not in a gene. And there's a loop here that is um, found in both uh, proliferating and senescent cells. There's a bunch of loops to the right that are there all the time, but you can now see there are two loops that come up in senescent cells only. And, and one of them specifically spans this element. And if you look at the, so this is now the element itself. Here it is. It's being transcribed right to left. There's a pseudogene next to it that is transcribed in this direction. No one knows what that thing does. Uh, interestingly, it's regulated in the opposite way. It's down-regulated in senescence. And this is now that intact element. These are three different samples that is being upregulated. Up so very quickly, for the last five minutes, I'm going to switch to Alzheimer's disease. So we're leaving our favorite fibroblasts and continuing with the theme of DNA sequencing. Uh, so nanopore allows you to call methylations. And so we did that and we found that uh, Alzheimer's, so this is brain uh, specimens from the prefrontal cortex uh, stratified by Brock stage. I'll show you some of that data later. And you can see that the Alzheimer's brain is uniformly hypomethylated. And uh, as you would probably predict, retrotransposons ride that wave of hypomethylation. And these are the PAs. And finally, here is our friend L1HS. And so we can stratify this a little bit further. And... Um, we're now looking at uh, here, finally, are your intact elements. Now, the degree of methylation is still pretty high. This is average across the whole element. And so you're something like 80% methylated, which you would expect, because normally in somatic cells, line one is, is in heterochromatin is methylated. And this change, although it is statistically significant, you know, is that really meaningful? Um, you know, I was a little dubious about this. Uh, maybe I still am, but let's see what happens. So now we are looking across the element and we're using a sliding window in which we are scoring the methylation. And here are two loci. Here's an intact locus on chromosome one. Here's an intact locus on chromosome four. Here's the five prime UTR. This is where the promoter is. There's a huge CPG island right there. And lo and behold, in one of these elements, it becomes hypomethylated and very clearly. And, you know, I'm just showing you two examples. 
we have you know other examples of this. However, the degree of methylation loss is again, you know, it's there, and I think it passes some kind of statistical test, which I don't understand, but does it really mean anything? Um, so now we're looking at the individual uh, reads, and so this is 30, 40 reads from that one genome across that one CPG. And I think the way that they scored this was that the, the open circles are methylated and the black circles are not methylated. And the interesting thing is that there's a lot of heterogeneity. Now, don't forget that this DNA has not been amplified. This is n DNA, native DNA, coming out of the brain that you're sequencing. And so every, every read is one molecule of double-stranded DNA from that from that pool. And it's interesting, I think, that there are some reads that seem to be completely demethylated. So somewhere in that complex mixture, there are molecules uh, that have completely lost methylation over, over this CPG island. And um, I don't want to make a big deal out of this because we're still working on this and still going through all the various statistical tests. But this is all the Alzheimer's cases, and this is all the control cases. And you can see that particularly in some of the Alzheimer's cases, you are seeing uh, molecules that are completely de demethylated over, over that CPG island. So I'm just going to show you one more data point, which I also think is interesting and that is now we're looking uh not at cpgs we're just looking at the reads and this is in the igv browser so we're looking at this point here uh this is in the middle of a gene but it's in the middle of an intron and this is 50 base pairs so this is very very granular and if any of you have looked at uh nanocore sequencing it has a lot of mistakes, <laughs> so it looks like this, okay? And uh, since this is so zoomed in, this is a single nucleotide deletion. So, the, you know, as you know, nanopore mostly is prone to indels, and that's demonstrated very clearly here. Uh, these are deletions of one, two, three base pairs, and then each of these bars is, is an insertion, and, it, and if you click on it, it tells you what was inserted there, usually one or two nucleotides. So you click on this one, and holy shit, what, what is this? Well, that's alu. <laughs> and this is the tail. This is the tail of the alu. So this alu is uh, right to left in orientation, and it continues here. You know, the, the, the visuals are not very good, but if this was live, I would scroll through 300 base pairs of perfect alu sequence, evolutionary recent alu live. Um, and so this is now really, really zooming in. So these are now individual positions. Here's a deletion here. Here's a deletion here. There's a mismatch. There's a C where a T should be. Uh, you click on this, and uh, I forget what nucleotide it was. You click on this, and out comes a perfect value. So uh, this, we, we call these singletons. And, um, you know, it looks like these are uh, new transposition events that were, that were sequencing. So, and it, so it looks like the tissue is highly polymorphic, um, and there are uh, what seems to be alu transposition events, and we've quantified this over our panel. Does not seem to be associated with disease, we need to do more reading. It might be associated with age because you see this 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 individual here, control five, uh, that's Brock zero. So it's a perfectly you know you know normal, well old but you know non demented. Let's put it this way. It also happens to be the oldest individual in the whole pan. So again, you know very sparse data, but um, kind of interesting. So um, now I'm going to just tell you um, 
two or three minutes about clinical studies because we're kind of going back to uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So I showed you uh, some of our data where we fed 3TC to, to mice, and I actually was funded by the NIH to use this drug on some models of neurodegenerative diseases like tauopathy mice. And, and then COVID happened, and some other labs did it, uh, which is very convenient because I don't really enjoy mouse experiments so much. I like biochemistry much better. But they used 3TC, and they used exactly the same protocol that we published. And I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but 3TC does seem to have protective effects in terms of cognition and also pathology in two different uh, models of mouse tauropathy. And so that led me to start, to, to start a clinical trial at Brown and this is still ongoing, and we're using a drug that is uh, related to 3TC. It's in the same class of drugs. Uh, this is uh, Megan. She's the clinical PI. We're about halfway through uh, the uh, clinical trial. I can, however, report to you on uh, some clinical trials that recently have been completed by transposon therapeutics. And the disclosure here is that I am the scientific co-founder of this company and I'm on the board of advisors. And um, a while ago, they released data from a phase two study uh, of uh, a different inhibitor uh, on a neurodegenerative disease called progressive supranuclear palsy. And so this is this is the drug. Um, they call it TPN101, but it's in the public domain. It's called Sensavudin, and it's a thymidine. In fact, it's very similar to AZT, the, the first ever HIV drug. This is the four prime position on the ribose. AZT has an azido group there. That's why it's called AZT. This has an alkyne group there. And so the name of the game with these, these reverse transcriptase inhibitors is their chain terminating drugs. The, you know, this is like di, di deoxy sequencing. Um, and this position uh, seems to be very interesting because if you put a bulky group there, it uh, reduces binding to cellular polymerases. Cellular polymerases, DNA polymerases have a very tight uh, nucleotide binding pocket, and this just doesn't fit there. The reverse transcriptases have a much larger pocket, and just a few months ago, the crystal structure of line 1 RT has been reported and makes perfect sense why a molecule like this would, would fit there. And so this, this molecule, in fact, has an IC50 of 70 nanomolar, and it was, uh, put, it was developed by GSK, uh, as an HIV drug about 10 years ago, but then it was abandoned for financial reasons. And so this drug went into clinical trials. So for PSP, you had uh, 42 patients total that were screened, uh, randomized one to one to one to one. Uh, there were four arms. You have the placebo arm, and then you have an escalating dose of TPN101. 24-month double-blind treatment, and then followed by a 24, sorry, week um, open-label treatment where pretty much everybody gets the drug and everybody knows they're getting the drug. And then we're looking at the, the marker of particular in interest is neurofilament uh, light, which is uh, popular these days as a marker of neuronal damage and particularly neuroinflammation. And so the results are here. There seems to be a dose response, um, specifically now looking at NFL and CSF. So these patients had CSF drawn before and after uh, the end of the study. And uh, this is the double blind period, so 24 weeks. It almost reaches uh, statistical significance. This shows you all the individual patient data 
uh, there's the regression and the slope actually does pass statistical significance. Uh, another marker that uh, uh, was very interesting was IL-6. Remember IL-6? We talked about that in SAS. You can see that uh, the placebo and the two lower doses show moderate increases during the double blind. The highest dose is going down. And then when everybody is changed, uh, switched uh, to the 400 dose, then everybody goes out. Now, I have to say that these are all trends. None of this, if you look at the error bars, is actually statistically significant. Um, now, as, as luck would have it, just yesterday, Transposon uh, released a press release. This is the press release uh, yesterday. These are the final results from a similar study, but now for ALS, ALS F. FTD, and a particularly genetic, so this is uh, the C9 Orb 72 uh, triplet expansion uh, patients uh, that invariably uh, uh, develop ALS. The study design was, uh, was similar, but it just had two um, uh, regimens at placebo and 400 milligrams of, of um, uh, TPN 101. And uh, I don't have the actual data, but the reason why I'm showing you this is that the same markers came up. Uh, NFL, now NFH, uh, neurofibrillament heavy, and also IL-6 um, uh, was uh, decreased in this study. And more importantly, over the PSP study, there were... Um, clinical benefits that were seen. In the PSP study, there was no uh, change in the in the sc testing score, but here uh, there was a decline in the vital capacity, which is a measure of uh, respiratory capacity in these patients. And also on another uh, scoring scale, there was there there was a change. And and combining the two studies together, uh, the NFL lowering effect uh, becomes uh, statistically significant. So just thought I'd give you a little bit of a flavor, uh, you know, kind of going all the way from cell biology through biochemistry to the clinic, um, that actually this program has accelerated very, very quickly as soon as, you know, we kind of realized that probably the most important effect, or at least a, a very important effect of uh, line one uh, derepression is the triggering of the interferon pathway. And that down-regulating that uh, has, has beneficial biological effects. So with that, I will stop because I think I've probably outstayed my welcome at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's super interesting. Um, we've got a couple minutes before the hour. So if there's any questions, if anyone wants to jump in. Hi, that, um, this is Bob Vassar in, in neurology here at Northwestern. Uh, great talk. Very interesting and exciting results. If, um, if you could speculate on the mechanism of uh, the neurodegeneration with the the activation of the line. Um, what would you what would you speculate? So your your drug studies here suggest that you are reducing uh, the neurodegeneration, so that the line uh, activation of the line is causing neurodegeneration. Um, and so. What can you speculate about, you know, what is causing the methylation pad methylation to be reduced and the line being activated specifically in, in Alzheimer's disease? Or is it, for example, could it be that the like the amyloid hypo uh, amyloid pathology in Alzheimer's disease could be causing the demethylation and that leads yeah, to the activation I, yeah. of the line and, yeah. and neurodegeneration. Yeah. So yes, that's 
really a terrific, terrific question and a very, very important issue. Um, there are, there is indications in the literature that line one activation or derepression might be downstream of tau pathology, and it might be downstream of TDP43. So that's the reason why, you know, the clinical trials were done specifically on uh, tauopathies and also, you know, ALS associated with TDP43. Um, the, the model is that the mislocalization of TDP43 uh, has, so basically the TDP43 is sucked out of the nucleus and that is has been associated, mechanism is not really known, but that has been associated with epigenetic changes and upregulation of retrotransposons. And so downstream of the retrotransposons, we think that, um, I think the most likely explanation is that it is reducing uh, inflammation because, for example, IL-6 uh, goes down. Uh, after you you treat with the reverse, so it's it's probably a progression modifying therapy. Uh, you know, I don't think it get. You know, there is there's obviously pathology before things start, uh, but it seems to be, you know, very very similar to aging or senescence. It it. Uh, seems to have beneficial effects because it slows the progression. Great. Yeah. And as you know, there are other uh, studies suggesting that somatic mutations are elevated in Alzheimer's brain, yep. as well as in aging, but more so in Alzheimer's. So I'm wondering if the activation of the line is, you know, causing these somatic mutations in AD. I think that is open for investigation now, which is, you know, why I'm excited to see those singletons. So there, there seems to be, uh, so now, of course, ALU is downstream of line one. We have some evidence that there are new insertions of line one as well, but line one is 6KB. It's really difficult to nail down. ALU is 300 base pairs. In one single read, long read, you cover the whole element and the surrounding unique sequences, so there's absolutely no doubt what you're looking at. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions before we sign off? Okay, well, if that's it, um, we're exactly on the hour, well-timed. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sidibi. This is a fantastic talk. Super excited that you were able to share with us.